Yeah, I was just talking to Rusty earlier actually about the title of this panel, How Humanity Fell in Love with Asteroids. You said you didn't know what it meant. <laughs> but, Not um, sure. It's an obscure one. <laughs> but um, Matt, it, really, we want to talk about the history of asteroids and the history of the observation of asteroids. Well, I mean, as, as I'm sure people have mentioned, the first asteroid series was discovered on the 1st of January 1801. And there's quite a story because this was an amazing event, a new planet, but shortly after the second one was discovered, and then another, and another, and another, and another, and another. And obviously they couldn't quite keep track of them all. And a few got lost because they hadn't been well observed and um, the orbits hadn't been properly calculated with the technology they had back then. And, but over the decades, all of them got found back, except one. So this is the great mystery of 719 Albert. 719 Albert was a very interesting asteroid because it's what we call a Mars crosser. It crosses the orbit of Mars and it's also an Amor class asteroid, so it comes fairly near Earth. And it was only the second one discovered, the first big Eros. And anyway, um, it was discovered in 1911 and was considered completely lost. And then in the year 2000, an astronomer at the Minor Planet Center, Gareth Williams, he had been basically trying to find um, 719 Albert since he was at school. And um, the Space Watch program, Jeff Larson, sent in his normal um, uh, measurements and Gareth Williams noticed a similarity between the orbit of a newly discovered asteroid that was a 2000 JW8, and he noticed a similarity between this asteroid and 719 Albert. And he made the connection, did the math, he got it back. And this is amazing to me because now the exact position of every single one of nearly 500,000 numbered asteroids is known. So he was, if you like, a celestial private detective. But it is still an area in which amateurs can play a key role. Absolutely. Um, actually, it's one of the sciences where amateurs play an essential role because the big surveys like Catalina and Mount Lemmon and PanStars and so on, these big surveys discover all the new asteroids, but they don't have the time to follow them up. And uh, the Minor Planet Center need a lot of observations to calculate the orbit. And there's a network of amateur astronomers, amateur in the sense that they do it for love, not that their work is amateurish, but there's a network of amateurs who do the follow-up and uh, observe the asteroids, send in the observations, and um, I would have to say that the leader is a chap in England called Peter Birtwistle. I don't know how he does it, but he does unbelievably huge amounts of observing with British weather. But anyway, <laughs> the amateurs are, are absolutely essential. and. Um, it's, I mean, I do, I, I do some of that. And the other fun thing is you get to discover a few asteroids as you go along. <laughs> Susan, how, how much did we know before we went there with spacecraft and physically went there? Because the, the history, I suppose, in terms of our understanding of the composition of asteroids, the nature of asteroids, has changed radically, and comets particularly, by going well, to Well, if them. we talk about the comets, I would say that humanity was not in love with them at all, <laughs> because... Uh, for a very long time, people thought that the appearance of a comet meant that somebody important in the community was going to die, like a king or a prince. And so it was with great foreboding that uh, a comet was seen. But now we have a completely different perception because it seems that the comets are tellers of secrets about the origin of life. Yeah, that's beautiful, tellers of secrets. In well, terms of the origin of life, we, we have mentioned the very it. original secrets, but we will progress further. But uh, if you take some of the experiments that were on board the Phila lander, there was one called COSAC and one uh, called Ptolemy, and they detected near the surface of the of the comet compounds which uh, were really key in the synthesis of amino acids and sugars. And then up on the spacecraft itself, there was another experiment which detected uh, glycine 
and glycine is uh, a constituent of proteins and also uh, phosphorus was discovered and that's a constituent of uh, cell membranes, DNA. So it's very tempting and very plausible to say that the comets and the asteroids, as I mentioned somewhat earlier, did seed the Earth with ingredients that gradually evolved into prebiotic molecules and then uh, the emergence of life. But what we don't know, the next secret that we have to have is to know the chemical process, the steps by which this evolution took place. Mm. And there are people all over the world at the present time working on that. Now, Rusty, this is a, how humanity fell in love with space rocks. There is also how humanity became scared of space rocks. Um, in terms of the, <laughs> so can you tell us a bit about the evolution of the planetary planetary protection field? Right. Well, you know, it was 20 years ago, basically. It actually, it was 2001 when uh, Ed Liu and I and a few other uh, uh, astronauts and astronomers and engineers got together. Uh, because we were realized that a lot of these guys were discovering more and more asteroids, and yet, uh, frankly, no one was doing anything about what do you do when you find one that's got our address on it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and clearly, it was only a matter of time before we discovered one that was headed our way in a, in a threatening way. And so um, uh, that ev that activity then evolved into what today is called planetary defense or the planetary defense community. And uh, just to give you an idea or the audience an idea of what's done by all these people, because today uh, we have thousands of people working in this area, um, it kind of drops into a couple of different categories. Early warning is one large category of work that's done, finding them, uh, tracking them, being able to calculate their orbits and predict whether or not they're going to hit the Earth in the next hundred years or so. Um, then there's another set of people who are working on deflection. Okay, one's coming at us, we know it's going to hit or it would, would hit, and what do we do about that? How do we change its orbit so that it's not going to hit the Earth? But then, in addition to that, we, we realized as we got into this that in fact, uh, if an asteroid's going to hit the Earth, there are many, many political questions about, you know, who deflects it, okay? Do we hire the Russians? Do the, do, do the Russians and the Americans compete to get up there and push it different directions? Uh, <laughs> uh, how much does it cost? Who pay, wh whose taxpayers pay for it? You know, all these things. So there's a whole community now of, of non-technical people uh, diplomats, lawyers like Franz over here, um, business people, risk management people, uh, a whole other category of people who are also involved in the planetary defense issue today. Yeah, I just wanted to, I want to speak about the law in a moment, but I just want to ask Mark about the um, NASA as, as an agency. Um, how has the involvement of NASA evolved over the last few years? So, so NASA's been very involved from the beginning. Um, there was a, a report in the early 90s um, that w really constituted the first risk assessment, um, and it was a report to NASA. And, and, and because of that, of course, NASA doesn't appropriate its own money. Congress appropriates money. But, but Congress appropriated funding to NASA um, with the goal of finding 90% uh, of asteroids greater than one kilometer in diameter. And, and that goal has now been achieved. Uh, that goal has now been updated to uh, discover 90% of the objects greater than 140 meters in diameter. That goal, without the aid of a, of a space-based infrared telescope, is, is going to take many years, decades. Okay. Um, oh. So and that needs to be sped along if that, if that goal is going to be met any time in a the, in the reasonable future. Seems to be, how do you know whether you've discovered 90% of them or not? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> and, and there are statistical methods. Uh, and, and it's kind of like uh, uh, my colleague Al Harris, um, uh, who is retired from the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, talks about, um, you know, if you have a, 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 a basket full of marbles and you don't know how many there are in there, 
you, you pull them out and you can put a little X on each one and put it back in, and, and then you can count the number of new marbles that you pull out, and the ratio of the ones that you've marked to the ones you haven't marked mm -hmm. is some indicator of how many you've discovered. Yeah. So there, there is a statistical way, but of course there are complications to that because not all asteroids are equally easy to discover. Uh, Franz, you're a professor of space law, which yes. is quite a, quite a title. So the, in, in terms of how, how uh, far along are we at developing the framework for, I suppose, mineral, mineral rights on asteroids, who owns them? But as, as Rusty said as well, who has the responsibility to operate in space? Uh, do we have a framework? At the we moment? have a framework, but it's a pretty embryonic one because obviously until maybe 10 years ago, nobody ever thought about these issues, in, uh, let alone in a legal context. So it's only thanks to Rusty and, and other people uh, initiating these initiatives that we now start a discussion on what are these legal aspects, both in terms of the responsibility to go out there, to do something about it, who should pay for it, what happens if various countries have various ideas of pushing it left or right, and in terms of, and we will talk about that later, I think, about. Uh, are these uh, minerals and these asteroids appropriable? Can we do something valuable with them? Are they commercially exploitable? Hmm. We, we, we have a, <coughs> a, a tweet on the Twitter wall, actually. I'm just being told to pop over there and ask what it is. Yes, we've got uh, a tweet in from the ESA mission Gaia. And what it's saying is that they have discovered over 500 um, potential solar system objects. And what they need now is to confirm whether those truly are in the solar system. So they need the help of astronomers everywhere to look and to see um, if they can track these objects. So the uh, website to go to is up on the tweet and it's the chance to help confirm whether these 500 objects are actually part of the solar system or not. Thank you. Well, uh, Fritz, you you're, um, come from the commercial sector, essentially. Um, uh, how do you see um, the, the exploitation of space, but also the, the dealing with asteroid threats developing in terms of public-private partnership. We've got agencies like NASA, the Russian Space Agency, but also private companies. Yes. So thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to be from a standpoint of, of industry, space industry, to be present here on the Asteroid Day and to uh, talk to the uh, community. So, I mean, these are various elements that we see here. First of all, I mean, um, let's say if you look at the so-called threat of asteroids, we are going to, to see what can we do against that. Of course, since almost you mentioned another site, on either side was a very similar thing. Almost 20 years ago, there was a Don Quixote activity. So there was the, um, uh, the will to see what can we do against the threat of the asteroids. That was the first point to look at. And of course, at the same time, we want uh, to help as industry that research can be done. And I think the next uh, step here that we absolutely need to do is to have a um, kind of a demonstration mission like it's in, uh, discussed now in the AIDA dart aim context where we really go and see uh, to a nearby asteroid and really see what happens um, if um, uh, it is deflected what can we do about and then this is very natural that this technology demonstration leads uh, to the first step in exploiting asteroids. You know, this is very, very useful material. I mean, not, not only, of course, it's, it's the, the remnants, the leftovers of the uh, building of our planetary system and the Earth in the end, but it's really valuable system. So uh, this is something, I guess, um, with, of course, the initial help of the agencies, we have to address from a commercial point of view. This is something where these famous terms like business plan and so on come into play. And interesting is also the, the, the big uh, support here by, by Luxembourg and others this is really the time now where we are seriously discussing on that this is doable. So this is something when we are looking at the next 10 years, the next 50 years, where we believe we can do something about it. Uh, but first, um, if I may, um, let me also address, we have, I guess, many, many young people listening all over the world who are sitting here because they are also fascinated by asteroids, interested in asteroids. There's only something also as a space industry guy, I can only encourage them. If you really want to pursue a career in, in this, go for it. Uh, put every stone or obstacle aside to go for asteroids and, and join us later. I think it's an important point, isn't it? Because I think it can often seem as though we're talking about science fiction here, not only in terms of threat, but in exploitation of asteroids. And really, it is now, isn't it? We have the technology now to do this if we want to. Yes. 
Yes. Anyone disagree with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. When do you see it? Just in the last minute or so. Um, realistically, when, when do you see us beginning to exploit asteroids optimistically? Well, one, one of the, I'll comment to, to some extent. Uh, one of the things that you want to have, whether you're a, a miner in 1849 trying to find gold or, or, or in 2049 trying to find platinum on asteroids or whatever, you need to have a map. Uh, maps form the basis of the way in which you explore. You, you have to know where you are and where your mine is and whatever. And one of the things we're trying to do uh, today is to create a what we call a dynamic map of the inner solar system. We've got lots of territory out there, but in this case, the territory moves around at 30 kilometers a second, you know, and so it's always changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're by finding these asteroids and finding them all the way down to 30 meters or so, we can then create a dynamic map of the inner solar system that not only we can use to protect life on Earth in terms of planetary defense, but can also be used by the future asteroid miners, people who are going to go out and mine water or resources from the asteroids. So that's a very important element of what we're all doing. Just very briefly, but 10 seconds. Is it going to be commercial companies that make the step first when that legal framework's in place? Or is it going to be space I, agencies? I think so. I, if you look at the millions that are being prepared to be spent on that, that happens in the commercial sector. And that's, of course, where the lawyers come in, because if it's just government, Politics can often do the trick, although there's always an international level at which the governments have to agree on the international rules on how to handle that. But now that we have a number of basically US companies who are very serious about it, who have uh, billions of investments waiting for them, they want that legal certainty which only the law can give them. Yeah. And that's why a year and a half ago the US have adopted the first national law uh, quite specifically addressing this already. And Luxembourg is adapting a similar law uh, right, right at this time. So it's very promising. OK, well, again, <laughs> we're out of time. So, uh, but thank you very much. And over to you, Savinia. In fact, it's me. Oh. So I, can, I can be Sabini for you, Brian. So. <laughs> Well, there are over uh, a thousand um, independently organized asteroid day events taking place around the world. And now it's time to catch up with just a few of them. And on Skype, we have Asteroid Day in Chile. And I believe that you've been doing some short story competitions. Yes. Hi, this is Alejandro Clocchiati for, from Chile. We are really thrilled to be joining this so wide and diverse community of people uh, caring about uh, the planet, actually, I would say. We are not uh, a, a commercial or a space uh, agency. We are universities mostly, but we have organized a lot of activity here from literary con uh, in high school and elementary school kids to activities with kinder, kindergarten, and a visit to crater Monturaki in the north of Chile uh, in the hands of one of our geologists specialized in, in meteorites. And well, as I said, we are very happy uh, to be taking part of this effort in the world to learn more about asteroids and well, get ready. Sooner or later, we will have to be caring about one of these rocks and better be ready than sorry. Indeed. Thank you so much, Chile. And from one beautiful part of the planet to another, and Asteroid Day in Greece. How are you there? Uh, warm greetings from sunny Athens, Mr. Clark. Uh, today we are going to inform the Greek public uh, about two controversial aspects of asteroids for our planet uh, here in uh, Piraeus. The first aspect is about the disasters that asteroids can cause by hitting our planet. The second aspect is uh, that at the same time, these hazardous asteroids are carrying with them precious metals and minerals. And uh, I'm going to give new proofs now about my recent research about meteorite, uh, meteoritic craters in ancient Greece. Well, thank you so much for joining us here um, today. And we wish everyone who's uh, organizing these events well. Um, for now, however, we're going back over to Sabinia. 
Thank you, Stuart. And I'm now accompanied by Lynn Zunen, who works with Econ Economic Affairs at the um, Chamber of Commerce in Luxembourg. Welcome. Thank you. Um, of course, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce in Luxembourg is the major professional chamber of the Grand Duchy mm -hmm. of Luxembourg. And apart from being that, you're also a very generous sponsor and supporter of Asteroid Day. So why is it important to, to support a day like this? Well, today is a great opportunity for Luxembourg to show its long-standing commitment to the space sector. And irrespective of the activities we are going to pursue here, um, asteroid science is the underlying foundation. So um, it is very important to raise international awareness of that topic. So let's say, and people might have heard about it, uh, we want to become a hub for space mining, extracting resources from asteroids presumes um, knowledge about their potential impact on the Earth. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we see a great complementarity between today's event and the government space mining initiative. And um, I think in the end, if those activities are um, supported by a solid legal framework um, and a friendly business environment and also responsible research, mm -hmm we are talking about an ecosystem that is very promising for the Luxembourg economy. Mm. Well, thank you so much for, for supporting Asteroid Day. You really do, um, along with the Chamber of Commerce, help us to make it happen. So thank you, Lynn. And with that, it's time to go over to the Science Center and see what Natalie, what experiments or demonstrations that she is involved in now. Over to you, Natalie. Top, you can go. So this was a top because right now, Etienne Schneider, Deputy Prime Minister and Luxembourg Minister of Economy is not being teleported to the moon. No, he is being 3D scanned so that we have, can have a 3D print and afterwards offer him a selfie as a gift and as a reminder of Astro Day 2017. With me now, I have... Uh, Mr. Fritz Merkler, who is uh, responsible for the business development of uh, OHB, one of the leaders of the European space uh, technology industry. Mr. Fr uh, Merkler, uh, Luxembourg is a close uh, partner to OHB as E, uh, Luxspace, Blue Horizons right. are affiliated uh, companies that are located in Luxembourg. Why is 3D printing in space so important? Um, already today we use 3D printing for smaller structures, very complex structures which could be not properly machined with classical ways of uh, metal or uh, uh, plastic um, machining. With 3D printing any shape can be generated and in future it will allow even to generate these structures in space. If we bring today a satellite or spacecraft in orbit, it's very complex because it has to survive the first two minutes, which are the launch and very strong forces. If we could manufacture this in space, it would be much more easy, more simple, and at the end, more cost efficient. Thank you very much. And my next question is for you, Mr. Schneider. The Luxembourgish government is fully committed to help develop businesses in the space resources industry. You are also, you want to become one of the leading nations in asteroid mining. And the new law on the exploration and the use of uh, space resources will be voted soon. What makes this law so unique? Well, uh, first of all, I would say that uh, one of the, the arguments is that it will be the we will be the first country in the European Union to have such a legal framework and uh, we will be the second in the world after the United States to have such a legal framework which allows companies doing business in space to possess whatever they find in space and uh, that's something which uh, you know is not covered by international law right now. So we're going to have this um, framework uh, for all the companies incorporated in Luxembourg. 
Uh, Luxembourg is also uh, in the process of creating a national space agency. What is the goal of that agency? You know, uh, the, the, the goal of our space agency will be different than the ones you know, like NASA or ESA. Uh, our space agency really uh, focuses on new space, meaning that we focus on the commercial use of space. And, uh, and that's what we are going to put in place. And this uh, um, uh, space agency will be a public-private partnership between the government and, for instance, uh, venture capitalists, because we're going to create a fund, an investment fund, uh, which will decide upon the, uh, the industry, the companies, where Luxembourg will invest uh, into. Uh, what is the potential you see in space resources uh, for Luxembourg? Uh, I see the potential is just huge. You know, the, the question is not if that will happen, if space business will happen. The question is just when will it happen. And uh, I think Luxembourg is now one of the leaders. Uh, we are positioning ourselves after having had huge success with SES uh, in the 1980s. Uh, we created a huge uh, space community around SES. And now we are doing the next step, going into real space business until uh, uh, we will be able to do space mining as well. Thank you very much for this interview. And I have, of course, a last question for Mr. Merkel. Uh, Blue Horizon was created last month. You want to create necessary conditions for sustainable life in space. You have big plants. You even want to plan, uh, plan uh, uh, to grow plants on the moon, right? Yeah. So, uh, in particular, what Mr. Schneider said, Luxembourg has really fertile grounds for new space, for new space industry, for new space business. That's the reason why we are here. And uh, out of Blue Horizon, we want to endeavor and to research how life can be sustained in space. Water is an important ingredient for life in order to produce food for long space mission on the moon, etc. To do it on the moon is not easy. It's not just taking moon soil and water and plants will grow. It requires proper environment and seas we want to study here and develop and build here. And uh, if we have a look here on the screen, well, this is not your picture, uh, but uh, later on you will get uh, your picture and uh, the selfie that you can take home. And this is it from the Science Center here in Diffadosh. Back to you. Thank you, Natalie. Well, from space business, now it's space research. And I'm joined by Naomi Murdoch from the ISAE. And asteroids are just one small part of our solar system. And you're engaged in a program of exploration to look at the planets as well. Absolutely. I'm part of the planetary science team, Aiza Superior, and uh, some of the missions that we're working on, one is a mission called InSight, and we're going to be taking seismometers to Mars next year, and we're going to put these instruments on the surface of Mars and actually listen to the vibrations of the red planet, mm -hmm. and that's going to allow us to study the internal structure of Mars. Another instrument that we're building to go to Mars is a microphone. So we're going to send this as part of the SuperCam instrument in 2020, and we're going to be listening to the sounds of Mars and sending those sounds back to Earth for the very first time. Mm. What do you yeah. hope to discover with those sounds? Well, those sounds on Mars, no one has ever listened to the sounds on Mars before. So one of the things we want to listen to is the laser that is going to be hitting the rocks on Mars. It's part of the SuperCam instrument. And we want to listen to the sound that that laser makes in order to understand the, the mechanical properties of these rocks. Very and another, cool. sorry. So. Unfortunately, time is pressing as okay. always, and thank you so much for that explanation. Okay. But welcome. now it's time for us to go back to Brian as we discover how we track asteroids.